Besides, an experiment like Harry's had already been done. The oil company Exxon is interested in carbon. They had put graphite into a similar system. Carbon was a horrendous mess. Made the machine absolutely <laughs> filthy. But one of the uh, interesting benefits of it uh, was that we ended up seeing a very unusual mass spectrum. This is the mass spectrum they produced. There were small clusters with odd numbers of carbon atoms, then a gap, then clusters with even numbers of atoms. They suggested unusual carbon chains. But more curious were the clusters of 60 atoms, C60, which were twice as abundant. Exxon reported these, but did not pursue it. We did not identify C60 or C70 as being or stable or somehow unusual. But it's the name of the game. I think, you know, in retrospect, uh, we can say that I was being cautious. At the time, I was being considered by most of my colleagues as being pretty wild, even daring to publish those results. <laughs> well, almost a year and a half later, after I'd been to Houston, I got the call from Bob right out of the blue. He said that Rick had decided that we could do the experiment. On one particular day, I gathered my students in and said, so what, what's the worst possible thing that could happen? This is to Sean O'Brien, Jim Heath, and they said, Harry's coming. I was so excited. I pitched some money out of my wife's bank account, got the cheapest ticket I could, and was there within three days. Good morning, so it's Houston, your final destination. I was keen on doing the experiment myself, and really absolutely over the moon that I could do it. What followed, none of them will forget. Harry did run after run of graphite vaporized by laser with graduate students to help him. Fellow chemist Bob Curl bounced ideas off the group. Rick drifted in and out to see how they did. It was basic research at its creative best. They saw evidence of the long chains of carbon atoms that Harry was sure existed in space. They also saw something else, the clusters of 60 atoms that Exxon had seen, but more of them. Again and again, 60 was the cluster that carbon preferred. Now Rick really did get interested in what Harry was doing. Why did carbon atoms form such a stable cluster? What was special about the magic number 60? If there's any element we know how it bonds, it's carbon. And we know with many examples that carbon likes to bond, usually with four other atoms. Uh, and in fact, in diamond, the, the, the pretty form of carbon, that's exactly what it does. I have, a, I have a model of a little piece of a diamond lattice here. You can see that each carbon atom, for example, this little black dot, connected through these green bonds to four other carbon atoms. That is, except if they're on the surface, in which case there aren't the little black balls to connect with, and these dangling bonds don't know what to do. Now, ordinary diamond doesn't have a problem with this because hydrogen uh, is used to terminate each and every one of these, these bonds. And in fact, if you have a diamond ring on your finger and you touch you move your finger across the surface of the diamond, you're not touching carbon at all. There, because it's hydrogens on the surface, and in fact, you're rubbing a single atomic layer of hydrogen on the surface. But we knew we didn't have any hydrogen in the machine. Well, there is another way that carbon can bond that we know about as chemists. That's with just three other atoms. Um, and the most common form of this, as we know, is just plain old graphite, which is, in fact, infinite planes, or effectively infinite planes, huge planes of sort of chicken wire lattices like this, connected six-membered rings, each carbon connected to three others. And in graphite, there's one plane against another stacked up. But once again, here are these edges. These dangling bonds should attract other carbon atoms and make a cluster grow. Yet here, they had a cluster that stopped at 60. Why? We wondered what could possibly make it so strong. We thought about many possible structures. And as it went up and down on it, like a yo-yo on various runs that we did, 
We came to the conclusion that perhaps it was a closed cage of some sort. Let's suppose we go back just to a single large sheet. And this has roughly 60 carbon atoms. Obviously, it has a lot of dangling bonds around the edges, but suppose somehow we're able to wrap around so that these dangling bonds here could connect to those dangling bonds. Maybe there was some way of wrapping that sheet around to do it, but we couldn't really imagine how that would be done. The team toyed with a novel idea. One image which was in my mind from way back, it was that of Buckminster Fuller's dome at Expo 67. The design of lightweight spherical structures was the life's work of the architect Buckminster Fuller. 360 degrees, that far, it becomes a plane and goes to infinity, won't return upon itself from the common center. We begin to get then spherical. His was the idea of the geodesic dome. These are what we call geodesic radomes. In fact, one time I had considered writing to him for a job because I was interested in many of his ideas. But at the same time, I was offered a job at Sussex. And so I finally plumped for a career in science rather than one in architecture and graphics and design. Both Rick and Harry had visited the famous dome at Expo 67. I remembered going into Buckminster Fuller's dome and pushing my son in a pram up amongst the escalators and towards the struts, that were the intricate structure that held the, the dome together. In fact, one aspect of it is that it really did seem to be made up almost completely of hexagons. Here, after all, we had a hexagonal sheet. Maybe if we figured out how Buckminster Fuller did this, we could figure out how to curl these things around on each other. The other thing that I remembered, as well as about Mr. Fuller's geodesic dome, was a star dome, a map of the sky on a polyhedron that I'd made for my sons many years beforehand. In my memory, it had hexagons, but it also had pentagons. I wondered whether it had 60 vertices and thought about ringing my wife and getting her to count it. But I was going home the next day, so I thought, well, I'll count it myself when I got there. <laughs> At Harry's farewell dinner, they talked of layers of graphite, closed cages, and C60. We were drawing on the serviettes and drinking Mexican beer, and uh, really very excited about what C60 might actually be. And in fact, they've taken away the serviettes on which we drew the structures, unfortunately. Rick went home, drew out, and cut up little paper hexagons. Harry went to bed thinking of the star dome stored in a box in his basement. Sixty gummy bears joined by toothpicks was the scheme adopted by graduate student Jim Heath. The candy model collapsed. The hexagons would curve only by cheating. Hexagons side by side only make a flat surface. Then Rick remembered the pentagons that Harry had talked of. Hexagons around a pentagon. They automatically curved. They made a bowl shape. Then more curves, more and more, all linking. A geodesic sphere. 60 points, 60 carbon atoms. The shape of C60 formed in Rick's hands. I almost called to get Harry out of bed to tell him about it, but it was 3 o'clock in the morning. I disciplined myself to go to sleep. We couldn't be the first people in the universe to have discovered this structure. They ought to know about the mathematics department. So I called up Bill Beach. I said, Bill, sorry to bother you this morning, but we have this hot new structure for a carbon molecule. And it has uh, 12 pentagons and 20 hexagons. I wonder if you could bother asking one of your students to find out what this polyhedral object is and give us a call back. And he did call back, 
Bob Curl answered the phone, and, and uh, the mathematics chairman said, well, I could explain this to you a number of ways, Bob, uh, but what you've got there, boys, is a soccer ball. You can imagine this excitement that you've discovered a way of putting 60 carbon atoms together that turns out not only to be beautifully symmetric, but it's a soccer ball, too. Their paper to nature was a front cover story. A really beautiful picture of C60. It almost looks like you're looking at stars in the sky. It was just such a fantastic moment that as I took the plane back, I was on such a high that I don't think, I think the airplane would have actually flown without the engines running. They named their structure Buckminster Fullerene. Buckyballs. Perfect symmetry in a molecule. Symmetry enchanted the ancients. The Greeks then have one word that we need to say. A hollow cage of carbon, what properties it might bring. The Greeks believed that perfect solids encased the fundamental elements, fire, earth, air, and water the icosahedron. Slice off the points and the shape is C60, a ball of carbon, a billionth of a meter wide. Nature loves the geodesic sphere. It's seen in viruses and microscopic sea creatures. Harry and Rick had hit on a mathematical law that any number of hexagons will curve to a sphere if linked by just 12 pentagons. The Expo Dome had pentagons. A tortoise needs one to curve its shell. So did Harry Stardome. It was so beautiful that it just had to be right. But there were people that needed convincing, quite a lot. And the question is, how could we set about proving that it had this structure? That was really the next part of the story. And to me, it was something like five long years in the desert. They had never captured the elusive Bucky, only its traces. A cluster you cannot see or touch. How do you prove the shape of something measured in electric fields held for only milliseconds in a laser beam in existence only as long as the experiment? A cluster of 60 atoms was all they were certain of. The sphere, the soccer ball, all that was theory. The theory ran into trouble from those who also had seen evidence of C60 before. The Exxon team argued that maybe there were no more C60 clusters than other sizes, only that conditions in the laser might make them show up more. C60 might not be special at all. In Houston, they tried to prove the structure by breaking the cluster apart and measuring the pieces. This is Texas, and we have big lasers, and we have knobs we can turn up, and we can make the laser tremendously powerful, enough to drill through a hunk of metal. We found that we could finally turn it up so that, yes, finally C60 would fragment. The amazing thing is that it fragmented by losing little C2 pieces, dimers of carbon. The result is just simply, you've got a ball, you blast it with lasers, you get very hot, it evaporates C2 off the surface and it shrinks. And as you keep blasting laser energy, it shrinks more and more and more. They got readings of C58, 56, 54, and on down until the strain on the atoms was too great. It's just what you would expect if, in fact, it really were these closed cages. When you blast it, there aren't any edges. No places can just fall right off, so it shrinks down until finally, critically, at C32, the next step is it bursts. For most molecules, that would already have been considered a proof of the structure. But this is too important a molecule to just casually say you've proved it. Exxon kept up the counterpoint. They said the whole thing could be just an experimental artifact. 